All right, with me in the studio now is Kathleen Angoon. And Kathleen, welcome back to Fast Forward. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, now the last time you were here, we talked about In War Times, mm -hmm. which was your book about Sam and Betty Dance. Yes. And your latest book is This Shared Dream, out from Tor, and it's a sequel. It's about the, the children mm -hmm. of the Dance family mm -hmm. and what goes on with them a number of years after the uh, In War Times, yes. correct? And it's a very interesting book. And one thing I've got to bring up at first, because we're, we're shooting here in Arlington, is this book takes place mostly in Washington, and you're from here, so there's a lot of real Washington stuff in it. Yes, yes. Michael Deirdre said in his review that um, people actually took the right metro line. <laughs> so that's yeah. nice. And by the way, that was a really nice review from Michael Deirdre. That must have felt really good. It, it did, it did, especially since I've been reading Book World since it began in the 70s. And I have written reviews for Book World. So it was, it was just a very, very nice review. Now you're from, you, you lived in Washington a long time, right? We, um, we arrived in Washington uh, on, uh, I think it was New Year's Eve on the, uh, uh, in 19, well, 1961. And uh, we had driven from Ohio. We'd moved from Hawaii, where my dad was working for the Navy, and uh, in um, uh, working on the fire protection for the uh, uh, Arizona. And then we, he got a job at the Navy Yard here. We went went to Ohio. We drove here in one day through the rain, hail, sleet, and snow. And when we drove into Washington, uh, with my two little sisters in the car. All I could think of was we were at this big, shiny, wet, rainy intersection, and across this vast, bustling bunch of cars was a people's drugstore. And I said, let's go there and get comics. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> and uh, comics takes a, plays a part in, in both of these books in, in some ways. Yes. Um, because Jill, the uh, like oldest daughter, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Um, had, did a comic, mm -hmm. and she owns, one of the jobs she has in here, she owns a serendipity bookstore. Mm -hmm. Now why don't you tell us a little bit about the serendipity bookstore, because it was a real bookstore that you worked at. It was a real bookstore. It was owned by uh, a couple I knew, Steve and Danny Alloy, uh, and I got a job with them uh, as soon as I finished high school. And it was, it was a wonderful bookstore. Uh, I, I actually had a lot of control there because I, it was a, the kind of bookstore where you could go in and rearrange the books. And it's not like today that uh, um, this shared dream was uh, shelved at, in the mystery section at one of the Barnes and Nobles I went to and it took, you know, like 10 minutes of the people talking to each other, you know, saying, well, how can we move it and going on their computer and stuff like that. Uh, so it was an independent bookstore. It was... Uh, Eclectic, Steve chose what he liked to read and what he thought people would like to read. And it, w it was like a family. And uh, he opened several other bookstores, uh, one in Lake Barcroft, I think. And my mother, my mother was there. She had a candle shop in that store. And uh, it was destroyed in a tornado. Uh, I, for I forget the year, but it was... Uh, it was right out there in Fairfax. It destroyed the Pickett Shopping Center and uh, um, the part of Woodson High School, and uh, so it was a it was a strange demise. But uh, one of the people from from that store, Mike Nally, uh, has the Hole in the Wall books down in Falls oh, yeah, Church. Yeah, yes, I, I go there. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> it's good to know that mm -hmm. that line of real exactly. bookstores like that is still going exactly. on. Exactly, and 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 it really plays a nice part in. In, uh, in the book, yes. um, particularly near the end when there's a poetry reading going on. Now those poems that were in the book supposedly written by the mother of one of the, the characters that's mm -hmm. in both of the mm -hmm. books, um, and they're, they're about uh, losing people. Mm -hmm. And now you wrote, I assume you wrote those poems. I did, I did, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, I, I am a poet and if you want to use other people's poetry, it's very complicated. So it's just best to, to write your own poetry if you're going <laughs> to include it in a book. Now, what did you need to do? What was it like to write the poetry 
that was supposedly written by a woman um, the early part of World War II mm -hmm. who was was basically I think I forget what she wrote him in the concentration camp she or? was in uh, she was in she was a physician uh, a lot of the book is about or not a lot of the book but a lot of the backstory was about is the difficulty of women getting a higher education uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s uh, and so she was a physician as, as was her daughter Eliani Haddens and she was in um, uh, Hungary, I believe, um, tending wounded, and her daughter came to be with her. Um, and I think the father by then had been lost. The grandmother lived in uh, uh, in Russia, and so there was all this death and devastation. And th that's really the one of the cores of the novel is right. is the the history of the 20th century is so devastating, so violent, so. Uh, so intense. So this this was her reaction to it, and uh, I do write from the point of view of my characters. So it was just like I I was her, you know, seeing what was going on and in, in, in writing these poems. Yeah. Now the shifting point of view is one of the interesting things in the book. It's one of the things I that I really mm -hmm. like because you'd you'd read a chapter from the point of view of say Brian, mm -hmm. who's one of the the brother. Or Megan, who's the other sisters, Jill, Brian, and Megan, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> they're married. They have kids at this point. It's I forget how many years after the end of in more time. Let's see. It's uh, well, a number I of think, years. <laughs> yeah, a number of years. A number yeah, of years. Yeah, because I think at the end of yeah, about a decade, I think. Yeah, yeah, because they've. The, the, I think she, Jill, was marrying. Oh, actually, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a. Mm, let's see. Well, it's it's a number of years. It's a number of yes, years. They've, yes. Been gotten married. They've yes. had kids. They're mm -hmm. they have j real jobs. Mm -hmm. They have real <laughs> jobs. They're grown ups. Uh, and and you move chapter by chapter from points of view of the three siblings, mm -hmm. and occasionally the children or some of the other characters moving around, getting pieces of the story, and finding the secrets. Because a lot of the things that go on in the book is about secrets that are kept in families and, and yes it, 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 it's about the fact that they might not seem like secrets to those people that they assume it's part of the story of the family but when you actually get people together talking you find out that uh, certain people of, of one age uh, certain family members have a certain myth about the family and then the older and younger ones and the grandparents, whatever, everybody has a different idea of what the family was about because they're coming from different places. And in this case, it's it's kind of a, an extreme break because there's <laughs> been a break in time. So the uh, the younger children do not know what Jill knows about uh, why things are as they are, why their father and mother are gone. Right, and they don't, they don't remember the other time stream. Right. Like, like Jill mm -hmm. does and they, but other people kind of can remember some of it, and they, mm -hmm. they kind of do, kind of don't as the yes. book goes on. It's one of the interesting things, because we know what happened, particularly if we read in, in more mm -hmm. times, we know what the backstory is. But I think the book works, even if you haven't read the first one, because you, you're finding out things as the characters are finding them out. Exactly. Which, which gives you this, this um, almost suspense in it. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the book is philosophical, it's about a lot of things. It's also got elements of a thriller in it. Yes, yes. It's it's kind of a political and uh, international thriller, <laughs> if I do say so myself. It has uh, X O S S and CIA and and uh, 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 things like that. Yeah, uh, all kinds of all mm -hmm. kinds of thrillery things going yes. on, mm -hmm. particularly near the end. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned education, mm -hmm. and that's you know that doesn't often go with a thriller. But education is a key part of this book and what education means and how education at the right time with children can, can change them. I gave a talk a few years ago in Crystal City to a, uh, a Pentagon-based group uh, as part of a, uh, uh, an organization I belong to called Sigma and they, they're like a think tank. And uh, so I, I put in my idea about the subject which was uh, how to prevent terrorism, anti-terrorism, futuristic anti-terrorism 
uh, weapons. And my premise was that our best weapon against terrorism is, is universal education. And in that way, we can begin to communicate with one another. I think that the people there were not, uh, it, it, was, it was different because we had a lot of invisibility cloaking and things like that. But I went to the Montessori Institute in Washington, D.C. It used to be down on S Street. Now it's a part of Loyola University in Maryland. And uh, my diploma was signed by Mario Montessori, Maria Montessori's son. And it was very interesting because I was not convinced of the efficacy of Montessori when I first went. I was very skeptical. I was doing it mainly so that I could write. I had a degree in English. And I thought, well, how am I going to make a living? I thought, I can have my own school. I can do something good. But as time went on, I realized that Montessori, being a scientist, a physician, the first uh, woman to get a, uh, a doctor degree in Italy in 1896, big speaker at the first international women's conference in Berlin, made international headlines with the things she said about equal uh, pay for equal work for women. And uh, I just became very interested in what is now uh, a field that is just speeding along because we have functional MRI now, which I suspect is crude compared to what we will have in the future. But now we can, we have another lens on how we learn. And uh, that's, that's just my firm belief, that my firm <laughs> liberal belief that uh, education is good. <laughs> And, and in this book, education is kind of moved, in a sense, to another level by one of the science fictional elements in the book, which is the device which showed up in, you know, was built in in more times and has gone even further in this book and is now part of what you call Q. Mm -hmm. Now, why don't you talk a little bit about what Q is? It's to me, it was kind of like taking the cell phone and smartphones and making them even smarter and to where they're almost self-aware. Yes, it's, it's, Q is almost self-aware in that it is part of all of us internationally. And in particular, because the children have brains that are just developing, it can affect them more than the adults, really, because of the plasticity of their brains. And so they take to it like I teach at Georgia Tech and my students are very comfortable with manipulating all kinds of technologies. It's second nature to them. And every time I come across a new operating system or a way of doing something that I've always done but I have to learn a new way, it's like Egh. So in this sense, it's easier for the children to use Q and to communicate using Q than it, than it is for the adults. And they are the next generation that is going, that in which the potential is going to begin to be realized. Not that I intend to write that book, but no. that, that's, what, that's what it's <laughs> pointing towards. Yeah, and, and part of it is looking at war as a disease. And mm -hmm. this is something that can help cure that disease. Yes, I, I read a lot of books, a lot of research about the subject of why people, why humans are so warlike. A lot of different theories ranging from uh, biochemical to culture, uh, the history of humanity in terms of beginning as tribes. And, uh, but, but anyway, I tried to condense all of them and, and put that current into, into the book. And we waste so much money and uh, blood and treasure in these wars, as, as we are doing right now. And it seems so, uh, so futile. It seems as if there has to be a better way, and that's a lot of what the book is yeah, about. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of that in the book. Um, before we run out of time, I want to talk again about the music okay. in the book. Because like in most of what you write, actually, um, your, your nanotech quartet, mm -hmm. what I think of as the Crescent City books. Yes. Music is a big part of it. And all through both of these books, music, particularly jazz, is a big part of it and almost a metaphor 
for what's going on with the characters and what's going on with everything in it. And I take it you get a lot of that from your father. I do. He, uh, he is a jazz uh, aficionado. He knows everything there is to know about jazz, different musicians who played on this record. He saw everybody who was playing in the 30s and 40s live, made a lot of trips. So that's what I grew up with. And the, the, the essence of jazz is the improvisational aspect of it. You have a lot of different voices who in each voice is a part of the whole and, and they have times when they can do solos, times when they have to collaborate and communicate and trust one another to be able to do that. And that's uh, a big part of, of my, all of my books, that aspect of right. who we are. Right, and, and you see that in the relationships between you know, Jill and Brian and Megan they're almost in the book doing an improvisational <laughs> jazz routine with solos yes. and, and needing to learn to trust and, and work together mm -hmm. and all that. So it's, it's a really good metaphor for, for a lot of stuff. In yes, it, it is. Uh, and well, before, we're oh, get, getting close to running out of time. So before we do that, what's coming up next? You're, are we going to you going to continue the story of the dance family? Or? Not that I know of right now, but sometimes that's hard to tell. I'm, I'm working on a historical novel actually about the bonus marchers oh. and in the Keys in the, in, here in Washington and then later on in the, in the, uh, in the Florida Keys uh, and where they were working on the uh, transition from a railway to a road down to Key West when a major hurricane struck. So. Uh, that, that's what I'm working on now, but one never knows. Uh, as, since I turned that in, I started working full-time at Georgia Tech as a visiting professor, and I teach creative writing and science fiction and science technology and ideology. So I, ha I haven't been writing. I've arranged to teach only in the fall uh, so that I will have time to also write. It's fun, but writing is my heart. Yeah. yeah. And, and we love to read your writing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are out of time. Uh, and I'm, that's, that's too bad. There's so much more to talk about <laughs> about your stuff. Thank you very much for, for coming on the show. Well, thank we appreciate you, Mike. You taking time out it's of the always weekend. It's always great to be on this show. And uh, we'll look forward to the next thing coming, and I hope everyone gets to read uh, The Shared Dream. Okay. Well, that's it for this episode of Fast Forward. So from all of us here, this is Mike Zipser saying, take care. <laughs>